Hey everybody. Um, so this is the second time I've given this presentation and I always kind of feel, felt like it was a little bit odd to put this presentation together and give it because it's kind of a strange, we have like three seats up here and about six seats up here for anybody who likes to snuggle a little bit. There's room, especially these three, there's a little bit more space. <laughs> I kind of felt like it was a, an interesting, um, a strange idea to put together this talk because at a conference typically people come to hear about like one thing, right? So I gave a talk about an introduction to Angular. It was, that was really popular at the conference that I gave that one at. But to talk about test-driven development with Angular is kind of a strange merging of two worlds, right? So we got Angular and we got test-driven development. And there's not a ton of people who do Angular. There's not a ton of people that do test-driven development. So I'm kind of interested to see here, first off, who here came because they're interested in Angular and couldn't give a crap about TDD? All right. That's great. Please be honest. That's fine. Who here came because they're interested in TDD and couldn't give a crap about Angular? All right. Who here came because they're actually really interested in both? All right. And who couldn't find anything else to go to? <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, win, you win for honesty. Um, so my name's Joe Eames. And um, who here has worked with Angular before? OK. All right. Um, I'm a front-end developer for uh, Domo. I'm not going to get that to come up. Here we go. I'm a front-end developer for Domo, a little company back in Utah. Um, we do business intelligence. We've got a front page, a uh, single, applica uh, single page application that's got 100,000 lines of JavaScript in it. Um, it's mostly built in Backbone. And we're converting that to Angular right now, which has been a very interesting process and very fun. Uh, I've been a longtime believer of and fan of Angular for quite a while. Um, this is my Twitter. Um, if, you, if you're very interested in Angular stuff, I like to retweet Angular stuff. Um, I run testdrivenjs.com. I curate it, try to pull together um, stuff about test-driven development in JavaScript here. Um, it's been a little bit since content's been updated because I've been busy doing a course for Pluralsight.com. Um, I'm, on, I'm an author, author of Pluralsight.com. I just published my third course with them. It's screencasted training. This is a six-hour training on Angular, so if you do want to learn Angular, this is a great place to learn it. And I've got some cards here. These are free one-month cards to um, Pluralsight. It's going to give those out uh, for people to actually make comments. So if you're interested in a card, please raise your hand and make a comment or ask a question. I would love to uh, have a little bit more engagement from the audience. Um, and then I'm also a panelist for the JavaScript Jabber podcast. It's a really great podcast. We have a lot of good um, guests on there. We've had some great people on the past, and I'm sure more great people are coming on in the future. Um, so let's talk about TDD. Who can ex give me a very like 10, 15 second explanation of test driven development? Awesome. Awesome. So let's see. Red, green, refactor. We all familiar have heard of that term, right? We start with a, red, a failing test, we make it pass, and then optionally we refactor if the code needs to be refactored. So um, obviously when we do TDD, one of the hard rules that people don't always follow, but the things that they tell you to do is don't write any code until you have a failing test. Generally a good rule to follow. Um, only write the code that makes the test pass, right? And so that's kind of the basics of test-driven development. Now let's talk about the benefits of test-driven development. Uh, this I actually pulled from an article that I wrote on that website. Um, it was published in InfoQ. Um, but I'd like to hear from you guys. Who here could tell me what are some of the benefits of test-driven development? Uh, requirements in code. Requirements in code. OK. That's great. Perfect. You? Uh, keeps you from breaking things that used to work. Awesome. Awesome. Great. Awesome. Perfect, like that. <laughs> okay, good. Mr. Cunningham. Absolutely. When pairing, your partner is going to understand what you're doing. I like throwing in pairing. Um, so one of the things I, I wrote down a list of what I th think is the benefits of test-driven development. We didn't mention this one. Better code, right? 
If you test drive, your code's going to be better. Why is that? That's kind of a um, sort of you have to believe or maybe see to understand this, but testable code is better code. Testable code is less coupled. It's easier to maintain. It's easier to change. That's better code. Who here thinks that it would be better to write fast, correct code or maintainable code? Which one? Who here thinks it would be better to write fast, correct code? That's a great question. Let's say the general business environment, probably what we mostly work in, what most people here work in. Correct fast code. How about maintainable code? Right? You can fix a, you can fix a, a speed problem with maintainable code. You can fix a correctness problem with maintainable code. But you cannot fix a maintenance problem with bad code. All right. Easier coding. So this is like... Um, uh, you have to think less, right? Let me pull up my notes here. Um, it's easier to code using test-driven development um, because you only work, worry about one responsibility at a time, right? So you're thinking about less things. Um, let's go to the next one. Solution triangulation. I like this one. If you've got some kind of like algorithmic problem you're trying to solve, and you're not 100% sure exactly how to solve it, you can kind of triangulate on the solution by solving a simple case and then a more complex case over and over again. If anybody's done the bowling game kata uh, that Bob Martin does, it's a great kata to do. It's writing an algorithm to score bowling. And it's kind of a, you know, it's not a, a, a trivial algorithm by any means, but it's small enough. You can do it in a small amount of time. But coming up with the answer, like, right off the top of your head, kind of hard. But triangulating it through test driven development makes it a ton easier. Um, coding from the client's viewpoint. This is one of my favorites. When you're writing your tests, your tests are a client for the piece of code that you're writing. So you're writing from the viewpoint of the client who's going to be using your component. If you write from that viewpoint, you're going to write a nice API, one that's easy to use, one that's um, maintainable, one that has clear responsibilities and clear expectations. Um, more time thinking up front, right? If you're going to write a test first before you write code, you've got to start thinking about what your class does, what your component does, what this method does, how it, how it does it. You're going to spend more time thinking up front, and that's going to lead to better code. Uh, better unit test coverage, we talked about that. Uh, this is one of my favorites, sloth and temptation. It helps us avoid our sloth and temptation, right? One, we want unit tests for our code to assure that it's correct and to assure that it stays correct. But what happens when we test afterwards? We get pressure, right? We get pressure from our bosses. We get pressure internally. Um, one of my f things that I really hate to see is hero syndrome. Somebody who says, project's hurting, I'm going to rescue it, I'm going to stay late at night, I'm going to work hard, and I'm going to do whatever it takes to get this feature done on time. And whatever it takes is always a corner <coughs> that's cut that costs dearly down the road. So test room development helps us avoid sloth and temptation as well. Um, no extra code. Right? If you have to write a failing test before you write a passing test, then are you going to write um, tests around code that you actually don't need? Well, you'll be le certainly less likely to. Okay? You're going to be less encouraged to, less likely to say, hey, I'm going to make sure this handles some set of parameters that would never come in in any scenario I can imagine, but just because it would be fun to write those, those extra lines of code, I'm going to write them. Uh, documentation, we got documentation on our code, right? Especially if you use a nice BDD style of testing framework, you can really just read the tests and they'll tell you what your class does. Safer refactoring, right? Want to go in and change the code? I can make changes to the code and my tests will tell me what I've broken or tell me some, a, a point where my tests are no longer correct and I need to change my tests because I've changed uh, what, I, what the class is doing. Not technically refactoring, although that's something we commonly call refactoring. All right. So, the thing that I really like about TDD is it helps us to not be afraid of our code. All right? The great dispenser of all wisdom put it very well for us. And it also helps us avoid this situation. So I'd actually like to get into some actual coding. Thank you for leaving me a chair. Um, and I want to actually show some code. So we're going to do a little exercise and start doing code. Um, just for you guys, 
if you've given a comment, please, if you're interested in one, come and take one after the session. Or if you make a comment, please come and take one after the session if you're interested in the, the free month of Pluralsight. Uh, that's plenty of time to watch my course on Angular if you're interested in Angular, and that way I don't get a dime. <laughs> All right, um, this is WebStorm. Uh, I wrote, coded this up uh, just in an evening just to kind of screw around. I'll show you what this looks like here. What is it, of course? It's a shopping cart, right? Because that's pretty much all that anybody writes in programming is shopping carts, at least according to every tutorial I've read. So <clears throat> this is a very simple shopping cart, right? I've got panels up here for all my products. I like games, so put some games up here. And then I've got a cart over on the side that shows me what I've chosen. And uh, let's say I'm just putting this together, and I want to make it so that when I click on one of these cards, it'll add. Um, that item over here to my shopping cart. You can see, I've actually like was screwing around with this, and so my cart's got crap in it. But um, let's go back to our code. I don't. Uh, the point here is not to make this work. We probably won't have this working because we should end up talking about the code enough that we'll get. We won't even get, come close to a working solution by the time we're done. But I want to go through and talk about the TDD process show the TDD process for those who haven't seen it and hopefully try to convince a few more people that TDD is a good thing and also give you a nice introduction to testing in Angular. We're not going to be giving a comprehensive testing to, uh, introduction to testing in Angular like we're only going to show testing controllers and services so if you're interested in testing in Angular again plugging my self service self, uh, self uh, plugging my course I have an entire hour on testing Angular in that course, so if you do want to learn to test Angular, it's a great place to go, and it'll teach you how to t test every piece. So, um, the first thing I want to do is I want to have Karma up and running. So, I've gone through and configured Karma in my WebStorm, and just want to give you a quick. I actually can't see my same screen because I got my cheat sheet over here, so. Um, <coughs> Just very quickly, the Karma configuration that I want to have set up, the, if nobody's done or used Karma before, it's truly awesome and it's not at all limited to uh, Angular. It was built by the Angular team, but you can use it for any kind of JavaScript testing. And so I'm going to set my auto watch to true, so it'll rerun my tests anytime one of my files changes. And I just want to run it in Chrome. And then I've gone through and set up which files I want to uh, have it load up and run. And it's smart enough to know that I'm writing my tests in, I think, Jasmine. Um, I tell it right here, I'm using Jasmine and Jasmine Adapter. And then that'll let Karma just go ahead and run my Jasmine tests for me. I don't have to set up a, um, a test runner file, an HTML file. It is, I do usually run an HTML file as well and do that because the debugging is a little bit less effective in Karma than it is using HTML. Um, but we won't really get into that probably much so. Um, and then in WebStorm, I can set up my Karma to run right here. Um, does anybody, who here uses WebStorm? Nobody? Okay, so you guys don't care. Did we get a hand? Did I miss one? Okay. One. Oh, we got one. All right. You guys don't care. Great. So I'm running Karma now. So anytime I change any of my files, it's going to rerun my tests for me. So let's close that down because we don't need it. And over here again in my page, this is all represented by one controller, okay? So I've got a controller for my catalog. And you can go, we'll go over and let's look at the uh, catalog controller right here. So I've got my catalog and I'm, you know, I've got a catalog of items and so I'm going to bring in this um, catalog of items and I'm setting up the items and then I'm going to have a cart, obviously, of some kind. So I brought in some kind of a cart and set it up. But what I want to do is make it so that when somebody clicks on one of these panels, it adds an item to my cart from the catalog. It detects what I've got here. So let's go back and let's look at the HTML that I've got set up for my catalog. All right, so I've got this repeater for every item. And I've got a click event that says add and gives me the item. So here's one of the beautiful points of Angular, right? I'm not setting up like um, some function that has to go and look up maybe through a data attribute what the ID is of the current item but instead I can just pass in the actual current item and this is going to come through as an actual JavaScript object not an ID not a string this is the actual JavaScript object that represents this piece of data so I've got a collection of items this is an array um, which I set up here you know scope.items is this is an array of things and let's look at my catalog so you guys can see 
um, what my catalog looks like. It's just a very simple object that has an items property that's an array, and then a list of games in there, right? So I go to my HTML, I set up those items in a repeater, and then for every one of those, I'm going to get an li tag with the div, and that's, that's we actually see that here. This is, this is all dynamically generated, of course. But again, this, the key here is this click event. I want to call the add function, and I want to pass in that add function my item, and that will tell me, okay, this is the item I actually want to work with and test. So if I want to test drive that, what's my very first step? Failing test, red, okay. So I'm a catalog, I'm gonna to go to my catalog spec. So let me just take a quick second and explain what's going on here. Um, if you've never seen tests for Angular. Um, the first thing I'm doing is I'm basically invoking each of my two modules. This is the Angular seed, uh, is what I generated this on. It's definitely not the best way to set up your modules is by putting controllers in one module and services in another. Um, some people like to set other modules by feature. Um, I'm more of the opinion that uh, unless there's, we're actually using require, so we just use one module for the most part. We have kind of another module that's for truly, truly reusable components that we might hopefully open source and publish. But other than that, we just have, so we just have two modules in ours. They're, the seed is, the Angular seed that you can just download comes with the controllers in one module, services in another. So I'm just, I didn't, I didn't fix that problem. This should really just be one module invocation. Then I've got another before each. Here, um, anybody, everybody seen Jasmine? Anybody, has anybody seen Jasmine before, Jasmine tests? Okay, or at least another testing framework of some kind. So you're kind of familiar, we got set up here. All right, so it's obvious whatever the bar, our before each is gonna run before each test. Um, this one, this inject function is special. This is an Angular function, and this is Angular's dependency injector, okay? And so I pass into the inject function my own function and give it a couple of things. And these, Angular's gonna go and look those up for me. And then I, I need these two things in order to set up my test. The first one is this special controller object. And I, you can see I rename it controller constructor. That's because that's the object that's actually going to construct a controller for me. And then I just, I set a little variable here so it'll be a variable in my tests. And the other thing I need is this root scope object. Angular revolves around scopes and the whole job of a controller is to set up a scope. So, I'm creating a new scope object here, and I'll use that. It'll, it'll, it'll create one for each test, and I'll use that and pass it in my, into my controller. So whenever I want to test my controller, I can actually give it the scope. Because remember our controller, if you have used Angular before, the controller receives in a scope and then it sets it up. It doesn't construct the scope, it just receives it and sets it up. So you have to have one created beforehand. Are there any questions about that, any of that so far? Okay, so if you don't care about Angular or you're not very familiar with it, it's okay to just ignore this stuff. I pretty much just set it up so that I can test. Really what we want to do here is look at the flow of the tests. Understanding testing Angular is the, by far a secondary goal here. So my first test that I want to write is that if I click add on the page and call the add function, I want to call some function on my scope, right? And I've set it up in my HTML again, that it's going to call the add function on my scope and pass in an item, right? So I want to test for this add function. Um, anybody have any suggestions about my first, my, about a test for the add function? What, what, what functionality does, it, does the add function need to have? Adding. Adding. <laughs> All right. So I know that I'm going to have a cart, right? And when I click add, I want an item to go into that cart. Okay, so that's pretty, that's pretty straightforward. Let's assume that I've got a cart object. Okay, and I'm gonna say it should add the correct item to the cart. And since I'm just clicking on the panel, I'm gonna assume that I'm always adding one item. So I'm gonna say with a quantity of one. All right, um, hopefully there's nobody here in the, room is going to uh, uh, be very critical of how purist my tests are. So <coughs> um, we're kind of doing a couple of things here. We're checking that we're adding the correct item and that the quantity is one. So let's say I need to actually construct my controller. And in order to do that, excuse me. my mouse. All right. In order to construct my controller, 
Um, what I actually do is I call this a uh, controller constructor. And I'm going to pass in the name of the con controller that I'm, create, I'm constructing, which, uh, let's see here, where's that controller? Right here. You can see I've given it a name here, catalog CTRL. So I give it the name, and then um, I give it, at that, this point, the scope, or, or actually an object, which is its uh, dependencies. So if we look at my catalog controller, I can see I've got three dependencies, the scope, a cart, and a catalog, right? So whether or not I've set these up before or if I actually knew that I needed a cart before, I kind of thought this through a little bit and realized, okay, well, I definitely need a cart because that actually shows up on the page. Um, I need the catalog so I, can, I know what to display, but they also have this special scope object that comes in. I need to set that up. So I've got to have a scope. And that's going to be this scope object that I created right over here by calling new on the root scope. So scope. And I'll try to spell it correctly. Then the next thing that I need is uh, the cart, right? So here I don't have an object yet, so I'm just going to fill this in with a mock cart placeholder and then catalog. So for catalog, um, let's not give it that dependency. Let's use the real dependency. So here is another cool thing about Angular. If I don't include the dependency here, Angular will go up and actually look it up for real. And since I've got that catalog registered as a service, Angular is going to use this dependency injector, go and find the real live catalog and give me the live catalog because um, the catalog that I've actually got, this one here, really is just fine for my purposes. So I've created my controller. And then I want to call that add method on scope, right? And I need to give it an item. Uh, so let's see here. Let's call, let's create a variable called mock game. And an object that has an ID of one. And let's pass in mock game, okay? All right, so I've set up what I'm going to do by creating my constructor, and then I'm actually making the actual action. Has anybody heard of the AAA um, format for tests? Arrange, act, assert. I like, to, I like to code my tests that way, which is one of the reasons why I really hate mocks, not the general term mock, which is what everybody uses, but the purest form of mock, which is because you actually have to set up your expectations beforehand. So that's more of like a, a assert, arrange, act. I like arrange, act, assert. So I've got my arrangement, I've got my act, now I need my assert. So I want to make sure that it adds the correct item to the cart with a quantity of one. So what do I want this scope function to do? Well, I've got, I know I'm going to have a cart object, and I want to tell that cart object to add an item with a particular quantity. The only piece of information I really need to give it is probably the ID of the game that I'm going to add, and then the quantity. So let's just assume that I'm going to call cart.add inside of my function, and I'm going to pass it the game ID that was passed into the scope to the add function for the scope and the quantity. All right. So I'll set up an expectation here. Expect mock cart.add.called with. And since our, my ID was one for my mock game, it'll be one for the ID of the game and one for the quantity. To be, let's see, I think it's uh, to equal true. Oh, no, let's see, to be. I do a lot of mocha and chai testing, so going back and forth, there's just enough difference in syntax between jasmine and mocha and mocha's chai to really throw you off. All right, so I hit save and you can see it came down here and it actually ran my tests. Thank you, Karma. Ran my tests automatically for me, told me that one of my tests is failing. Um, let's see here, what do we got? All right, mock card is not defined is my error. Okay, so TDD has already helped me out. It's told me that I've got a problem in my test. I've created this, uh, I've 
asked for a mock cart, but I've never created one. So let's create a mock cart. So all that I know about mock cart is that it's an object that has an add function that I'm going to call. And that add function takes in two parameters. Thankfully, with JavaScript, I don't have to worry about signatures. So I'm going to create an object that has an add function. And, and I'm going to use sign on, which is my mocking library. If you're not familiar with sign on, but you're familiar with another mocking library, um, just because of the way the JavaScript works, there's just some kind of funky ways to create uh, stubs using sign on, mock objects using sign on. Um, what this is going to do is create a function or an object. That object's going to have one function called add. And this stub is really kind of like a little bit of a spy. It lets me ask questions about the add function. It creates an add function, and anytime it gets called, it'll record what gets called, the parameters, the number of times it gets called, whatever. And then later on, I can ask these questions. So I can say mockcart.add called with, and it will return a Boolean value and say, yes, I was called with these parameters that you asked for. So let's see if I save. It runs again. Different error. Object has no method add. All right, well, which object? has no method add. I know that I've created my add on my cart, so it must be, if I look at the line numbers, I should be able to tell line 19, right there, scope.add. My scope has no add function. Well, if I go back to my controller, you can see indeed I have not created an add function on my scope. So let's create an add function. Make that pass. No, it's not passing. Catalog controller, blah, blah, blah. Expected faults to be true. OK, so now my failing test is, hey, this was false. You expected it to be true, All right? So now, how do I make my test pass? Well, if I go back into here, and what it's supposed to be doing is calling cart, right? Cart.add with two, with one, and save. I'm passing. Green. All right, who was highly offended by the code that I wrote? All right. OK, I have plugged in some constants in here to make the, code, the test pass. Um, I don't always follow this logical step. Bob Martin gives this awesome talk called the priority. It's some long three-letter phrase. It's crazy, but it's really cool because he talks about when you're test driving code, starting off with the kind of minimal test cases, start off with a constant, and then move to uh, other things. It's kind of, it's, it's a really cool talk. But I like following that same kind of idea most of the time. I want my test to pass first with a constant. And then rather than writing the, just the correct code while the test still passes, I like to write another test and force my code to change and become more correct. As far as my tests are concerned right now, this code's correct, even though I know that regardless of what I click on, in fact, um, it's going to bomb because I don't have a, my cart doesn't work yet. But if I went back to the web page and started clicking on stuff, it would be adding in, regardless of what I clicked in right now, it would be adding in number, item number with the ID of one. Um, but my cart doesn't work, so that wouldn't, we can't even show that. But I want to make this, I want to force this code to pass. So I want to go and write a different test. All right. And I want to do a little bit of refactoring here first of my tests. Let's pull mock cart up in my before each and take that out and then go over here and out there. Okay. And then I'm okay with the rest. Let's duplicate that. Now, for those of you who are interested, I've got all this code on GitHub. My GitHub account username is Joe Eames. And it's just this ng shopper app app. Uh, repo on GitHub. And I've got steps for each of these places, and the steps will go far beyond where we'll get today, just so that you can kind of see. And that it'll be slightly different than what we'll code up today. Uh, it's always different every time you try. Um, so if you do want to see this code afterwards, just go ahead and hit my GitHub repo, and you can check out the code. All right, so in this one, should add the correct item to the cart. And let's just be a little facetious here when the ID is not. All right, so let's change this ID to two. All right, and now we should expect this is called with two and one. 
Okay, now we're failing. Failing test. So let's go back into our controller and make this work. So we know that this comes, brings in a game. So if we change this to game.id, all right, our tests are passing. Okay, let's talk about TDD. Let's talk about the fact that we started off with a failing test. We made it pass in the simplest. We wrote the minimum amount of code that would make that test pass. Then we wrote another test that demanded more of our code. And we slowly grew our code. We didn't write one test and then come in and code 60 lines of code in order to make that test pass. Right? We started small and we want incremental tests. What, are the, what is the value of having these small incremental tests rather than having like one big huge test that kind of tests everything? That's great. When we have a problem, the more tests we have, the more likely we're going to have just one test fail that pinpoints the exact problem. Or of the set of tests that fail, one of them is pinpointing the exact problem. The other ones are some kind of cascading failures. Okay, good. Easier to reuse and maintain the tests. The other thing, another good um, aspect of this really is the code and the way that the code grows. As I code in with constants and then start replacing it, this with real code, it helps me get my mind and my head around how the code operates and works. I'm seeing the interaction between, and this is super, super, super simple, but in a really complex problem, this makes a lot bigger difference of slowly letting your code grow rather than sitting down and saying, okay, I've got to write a shopping cart test. Shopping cart works, and then write up an entire shopping cart app, right? So another thing you'll notice and is my, my tests have only one expectation, right? I like my tests to only ask, and this expectation should really reflect what is in the name. Another thing I really like about JavaScript is your test names are strings and not identifiers with underscores. Um, the test kind of tells me what's important, and the expectation mimics the test, right? Um, that I call add, and I actually didn't should add the correct item to the cart when the ID is not one. So there's a little bit of a disparity there. Um, this, doesn't, this test name doesn't actually say, hey, it actually calls add on the cart. And I, I could potentially rename my test and say, should call cart.add with the correct parameters. Um, and that would give me more, of, more parity in between my expectations and the name of my test. But this way, these test names kind of give me more of an indication of what the functionality is of the class that I'm coding up and less of an indication of exactly how it does its job, but um, more of the responsibilities of the class. So I like that. So let's move on. We've got 12 minutes still. Let's move on and let's go on to um, our cart object. Okay. So here we got our cart object. This is a service, an Angular service. Very simple Angular service right now because it has no code in it. I'm bringing in the catalog. Here, I figured I'd need that at some point in my cart. Honestly, what I what we should start off with is no dependencies and then drive them in. Um, okay. So let's go to our cart tests. All right, in my cart test, I got a little setup here just to kind of uh, jumpstart us. Avoid, ignore this for a second, for the moment. Again, we got that same before each where we're invoking our module. In this case, since the cart is a service, it doesn't need controllers, so I'm only creating the services module and saying, telling Angular, hey, load up the services module. Then I'm also telling um, Angular, hey, give me this provide object. So this, is, this module function, you can see it, it, I'm kind of calling it two different ways. This is just kind of a funky way. I don't know why they decided to do it this way, but I have to call the module function in order to get the provider. This gives me basically the actual injector, dependency injector for this module. It's really for the entire application. But it's giving me the dependency injector, okay? And then I can tell this dependency injector, hey, whenever anybody asks for a catalog, I want you to give them this thing. So this is how I'm declaring mocks, right? I'm declaring my own simple catalog, so I'm not using the live catalog. This is kind of an, uh, just showing you the, another way of, um, instead of using the live catalog that I've got that had those items in it, I want to use my own catalog so that I can maybe muck with the data a little bit. This is going to be a lot more useful because in a real catalog, where is that catalog going to come from? It's going to be a hard-coded list? No, it's going to come from the internet and be a service. Good question. So 
not building a new module. This is just telling, I don't know why, but you have to call them, yeah, in order, if you want the dependency injector, you have to call the module function and, and pass in this particular parameter, and this will give me the dependency injector for not just that module, but the application in which that module lives. Yeah, yeah, this is, we, we don't call the um, inject function because that is the actual injector. I want the injector because I want to muck with it first before I call inject. If I actually called inject before this, um, if I'm, I believe that then trying to call this would actually fault because at that point it says, hey, my injector is already set up. You can't mess with it anymore. So just some internal Angular stuff there. The point here is when I'm dealing with a service and I want to have mock services, this is how I do it, okay? Um, kind of a detail uh, that isn't necessarily important, just that this is the hoop I have to jump through in order to do mocks in Angular and to mock a service out. So if I go back to my cart, I, knew that, I know that at some point I want my cart to take in the catalog, right? And that wasn't, that was just because I, I'm just jump starting here. In reality, I would have coded this up without any of this and just test drove in this functionality. But I want to jump start this to kind of show how to mock um, a service. And so up here, I've created some sample games that I'm going to use. And that way, it gives me this mock catalog object that's got just the games that I want in it. All right. Now, code up a test. So I uh, jumped the gun here a little bit. I actually created a test name. When I call add, it should add items correctly when the quantity is one, right? So here I'm going with what do I consider to be my very simplest case, right? When I, I want the carts add function to work. So that's why I put this describe here. It's just for the add function. And I want it to work when the quantity is one. So I'm going to tell it, hey, I know that in my other test, remember, I defined the interface for my cart service. I said, you're taking in an ID and a quantity. All right? So here, I'm basically fixing one of the two parameters the second parameter quantity, I'm fixing at one. I only want to test and worry about this working when the quantity is one. Later on, I'll worry about when the quantity varies. But now, I want to know that it works when the um, first parameter, the ID, comes in. That's the one I care about. So, and then, um, a slight difference with um, the controller tests is this inject function right here. This inject function tells Angular, hey, you're, uh, go, get me, go use your dependency injector, go find me the cart service and give it to me. So this is actually invoking the real cart service. Remember, this is what we're testing. We're testing the cart service. This isn't a mock. This is our real object, our system under test. This is how I tell Angular, go get me that cart service. Construct it for me. Give it to me so that I can actually work with it. Okay? We didn't do that with the previous. Right, because that was a controller. With the controller, they operate differently. I actually have to con call the code that constructs the controller because I have to pass in a scope, an existing scope, and the parameters to it. So the way the dependency, they both take in dependencies. The way that you use them in tests differs, whether it's a service or a controller. Just hoops to jump through with Angular, the way that Angular works. Just hoops to jump through because the two objects are constructed way differently. So now that I've got this test written, I want to make this pass, or, or I want to code up this test, right? So it should add items correctly when quantity is. So I know I'm going to have to actually have to call cart.add. And it takes in an ID, so I'll just start with one, and the quantity. And so since I said that the quantity is one, I'll pass in one as the quantity. All right, now what's my expectation going to be? Well, um, looking at my cart object, what I don't see is where I'm storing any data. So let's say, in order to ask the card object how it did this correctly, how do I know that it did the add job correctly? Well, the cart is responsible for storing the data. So I'm going to assume that, or demand that my card object stores the data and gives me an opportunity to ask that. JavaScript, that's very easy. I'm just going to create an array on the cart. So I'm going to say cart.items. And that's going to be an array. And I'm going to say that the length is equal to 1. All right? That's my, and I'm just going to code up just this much and run the test. And I get a failure. What's my failure? Object has no method add. OK. TDD telling me what to do next. I go into my cart and 
Do that. Next failure, cannot read property length of undefined. It's the items is undefined. So, items, an empty array, run the test again. Okay, now it expected zero to equal one. So the length is zero and it expected it to equal one. How do I make that pass? This dot items, dot push, value three. Run, and my test is passing. So again, I've just hard-coded things in order to make the test pass. Okay, this lets me slowly grow my code. I know that this is like, in this sense, when we're writing a shopping cart that's just got almost no logic to it, and anybody could code up in their sleep, this doesn't make a lot of sense. But when we get into real business logic, when we're actually solving some real hard problems, taking these baby steps makes a lot more sense. And it's better to start with baby steps, slowly grow your code, learn how to grow your code at slow steps, and then get comfortable about when to skip a step, when to take bigger steps, rather than start off by taking big, huge steps and not ever getting the understanding of, hey, when I take small steps, I get value and knowing what that's like, and then I get to decide when to take big steps. Rather, you know, if you start taking big steps, you don't know what it's like to take small steps and you miss out on the opportunity to take these small steps, make small incremental passing tests, and make them grow. So let's just make this, we only got a couple minutes left, let's make this, do one more test to make this code just a little bit better. It should add um, a different item if the ID is two. And I like the way that should add an item with an ID of two when the ID parameter is two. All right. Okay, cart.add to one expect cart.items, and let's say that the zeroth items ID to equal two. Run my test, and I get a failure, all right? Undefined, expected, undefined to equal two. All right, so it knows that the item, the item, uh, the object in the f uh, zeroth index of the items array has no ID f uh, property because it came back as undefined. Let's go back to our test and say, hmm, all right, I know that I'm passing in the ID. Um, I only need that parameter, so I'm only going to add that parameter. And let's push in an object that has an ID of that ID. Save. All right, now it's passing. So as I continue on, I would add more tests about, hey, um, I probably need more than the ID in my cart. I might need the correct cost. Um, so I'd add in another test that says that the cost is looked up correctly. At some point, I'm going to start driving, test driving in the ability to say, hey, um, add in a catalog to this and pull the information from the catalog, like the cost from the catalog, and then um, add that to the object. And driving in more and more functionality and slowly driving in that functionality. Again, when we're doing a shopping cart, this is, this is really simple stuff, and so it's like I feel like I'm walking like a baby. But when I go back to my real job where I do real complex code that actually takes brain power, doing these things slowly all of a sudden makes a ton of sense. So do we have any questions so far? Mm-hmm. So testing, for testing the server, absolutely, I like writing integration tests like endpoint tests. And then Angular also has a really nice function, piece of functionality. If I'm mimicking the server, Angular has a, basically a mock HTTP object that will call, um, it will basically override and hijack the XHR object and provide me the JSON that I want. Sign on itself, that library that I'm using for mocking, again, really the only library for JSON or JavaScript mocking, also has the same functionality to it. So using one or the other, I can mock a server and JSON responses and JSON sending. So, any other questions about TDD and Angular? Do we migrate it from Backbone to Angular? Um, probably two big reasons. One is that um, Angular is a newer 
framework and it just has a lot more functionality to it. Number two is we're reducing the number of lines of code by like 70%. So we'll have, end up with about 30% of the number of lines of code that we had in Backbone. Backbone's a library, not a framework, so it just doesn't do much for you. You actually have to build your framework on top of Backbone. Maybe put Marionette on top of Backbone, then it's more of a framework. But still, it doesn't do two-way binding. Just the two-way binding code by itself is a significant portion of code in a front-end application. Probably 20% of your code, 30% of your code is just to deal with constantly updating the server. So binding code, um, manipulating the DOM, and having it uh, show and hide things because Angular's got all that declare, all its declarative bindings where I can set show and hide variables, that significantly reduces the amount of code. It's amazing how much less code you write using Angular. But all, so far, everything that we've done has been 70%, and I've heard similar numbers from the industry. Uh, they can play together. Uh, the routers don't play together, so you have to choose one router or the other, and really the only router you can choose is Angular, because the Angular router won't always work with Backbone's router, but Backbone will work with Angular's router. So that's what was pretty much our first step, was we switch, swapped out Backbone's router for the Angular router. They will play together, but you lose a lot of synergy, right? Like, we write these cool directives, so that we can just slap in a, some simple HTML that says, hey, you know, give me this card. That doesn't work in, back, in the Backbone world, and getting the two to kind of own the same region of space in the DOM and work together just doesn't work out. By the time you get into it, there's only a few places where Backbone has a significant advantage. And when I say few, I mean in the typical business world. If you're doing things that are outside of a usual CRUD app, business app on the web, Backbone actually has a lot of really, it, because it's so much more low level, you can do a lot of things you just can't do with Angular. Angular is a much higher level, but for your typical business application, Angular is going to let you go faster. Any other questions? Okay, that was in my that was in my Karma configuration. I'm loading up all of my files here, right here. App.js, start.js. That's loading up all my my controllers and my services so that they're Angular or so that Karma actually has them resident. And then Angular itself is also run. So Angular sees those files, and inside each of those files, I'm calling like Angular.module or Angular.whatever, and that creates them and makes them resident. If there, if you have another if you have more questions about that then just come ask me and I'll explain that. Any final questions? All right. Again, if you would like, cards for Pluralsight are up here. Thanks, everybody.